Welcome to In the House. My name is Mark Shiver. So glad that you have joined us. This is a very exciting day. It's our very first episode of In the House. And uh, we're going to be talking over the next few weeks and months with members of the North Carolina House Republican Caucus. And I'm even more excited because our very first guest today is Representative uh, Jeffrey Elmore. Representative Elmore, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Mark. It's good talking with you today. Yeah, and I'm so excited. Now, let me tell everybody uh, kind of what you're, what you're doing over there. You uh, represent Alexander and Wilkes Counties. Yes. And you are chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. Yes. Vice chair of the House Education Appropriations Committee. Correct. And also you serve as vice chair of the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee, as well as uh, serving on other committees, but it sounds like you've got a full plate. I do. I do. I've, I, I, I very much have a full plate and I have to work too. So it, it's, uh, yeah, well, let's uh, talk about busy. that. Let's talk about that work. Yeah. You are the only member of the North Carolina house of representatives that is a teacher. Yes. I am the only working teacher in the uh, general assembly. Um, and it's, uh, I'm real fortunate to bring that perspective to the chamber. Um, and working with the folks and working with the education issues because uh, I'm on the ground um, when I'm at home uh, in the school every day. Been teaching for 22 years. Wow. And you've still got more hair than me. <laughs> I, well, uh, yeah, it's turning gray, though. It is yeah. starting to turn gray. <laughs> well, speaking of that, I'm going to cover mine up for just a minute because the hurricanes are in round two tonight. So uh, hockey's big and uh, go Canes. So nice. that's my lucky hat. But anyway, I wanted to ask you, um, because, you know, even though I work there, I don't get in on the, you know, the meetings that that uh, you do, obviously. Are there times when you kind of bang your fist and say, look, guys, I'm a teacher. I know what's going on and we need to do this and you need to consider that uh, in this legislation. Sure. I, I don't necessarily that's not my personality type to bang the table. But I, I will compliment my colleagues. There's many times when there's an issue and they will see it from the 10,000 feet or from the department level. And they'll look at me and say, how is this actually implemented? Uh -huh. or, how is this working when you are in the school uh, day to day? And with a lot of the programs that we've done, a lot of the things that we started up, it, it is a whole lot different on paper when it crosses my desk or uh, uh, crosses the desk of my colleagues that uh, they're interested in it. And then when we see actual implementation, which many times is there's a lag that could be a year later, uh, I get to see the perspective on the other end. Yeah. And uh, that they, they ask my opinion on that on several things on how is this actually working? Uh, is it positive? Is it negative? Uh, is it what we really intended? Well, it sounds like uh, your position as a teacher is very helpful to the uh, to the house. Oh, I, I, I hope it is. I, I, I think some people like it, some people don't, but that's the nature of politics, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of some people like it, some people don't, I don't think there are too many people in North Carolina that don't like racing. Right. And yesterday, you were at a kind of a big event, and uh, we chatted about that a little bit in the hall this morning. Tell us uh, where you were and what was going on. It was very exciting. I, I was at the uh, North Wilkesboro Speedway, which... Today is actually the 75th anniversary of the North Wilkesboro Speedway. It uh, falls on today. How about uh, that? The, the track has been there for uh, 75 years. It started out as a dirt track. Uh, and uh, I was at an announcement yesterday, a press conference where uh, Governor Cooper came and uh, we sat on Victory Lane, which is different at North Wilkesboro because Victory Lane is actually on top of the media building. They uh, would raise the car up and then drive it on top of the building uh, <laughs> if they won the race. Uh, very unique to North Wilkesboro, and that's where we sat. And uh, Governor Cooper talked about the administration's role and something that my office worked intently on, which uh, was the use of the American Rescue Funds uh, to create basically a motorsports fund. Uh, this fund that was almost $50 million has impacted 17 tracks from some of the smallest tracks in the entire state to uh, our largest, which is Charlotte, um, with um, 
relief money because uh, these tracks were hit very hard during COVID because if there's not uh, butts in the seat is the term that they use, they don't make money. And it really impacted the smaller tracks and it definitely impacted the largest track, uh, which is Charlotte, which is actually our number one tourist destination in the entire state uh, statistically. So I didn't know that. How about that? Yeah. And it's, um, it was very exciting. Uh, Governor Cooper uh, talked about the role of the department and how they are, um, uh, Department of uh, Commerce and Department of Cultural Resources are leveraging this money and who it was distributed to, uh, the, some of the things that uh, will be done with it. And then he talked specifically about North Wilkesboro. So uh, it, it was very exciting and it yeah. was uh, published all over the racing world. Uh, and I even noticed on the governor's uh, website, he's almost created a little commercial, but uh, we had some legends there. Uh, Harry Gant uh, was there. Wow. And, uh, Harry's originally from um, the lower part of my district, uh, Taylorsville, and he was there. He never changes. He looks the same as he did uh, 30 years ago, and Richard Childress was there, uh, and uh, it was nice. They had old cars. I uh, had one of Dale, uh, Dale Sr.'s, uh, Monte Carlo's there, uh, had Harry Gant's Skull Bandit car, uh, and some of the real old cars that were uh, ran in the late 40s. Wow. Uh, I remember there. that Skull Bandit car. Oh, yeah. 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 It was nice. The green, uh, yeah. that, that was the key right there. But uh, it was an exciting event. And it, it's very exciting for our community and all of the communities that are impacted uh, by this money. Uh, they estimate that the economic impact regionally for Northwest North Carolina, uh, if this track is open, operational, functional, which SMI has committed themselves to having a year round venue with various things happening, that it can be as much as an $80 million annual economic impact for the region. Wow. And for my area, uh, we teeter totter between being a tier one, tier two county. I believe we're in tier one status right now. That kind of economic activity is transformative. Uh, and it was very excited, uh, exciting to be uh, taking basically a little germ that the governor had uh, an idea that's what i call a germ and then expanding upon it to have an impact on our state sport uh which is stock car racing and and impact the industry from the smallest level all the way up to the biggest uh, it, it was one of the best things i've ever worked on uh in my tenure uh here in raleigh yeah we uh tell us what what you what were you doing what kind of behind the scenes stuff were you talking to people uh, meeting with people? Sure, sure. Uh, I had to get buy-in. Uh, the governor had it in his proposed budget, but at very low levels, there were local matches tied to it. It was basically focused on three tracks. Uh, he did have the idea of a moonshine heritage trail, which we played upon. Uh, so what we did, we uh, worked with uh, the motorsports uh, caucus liaison, uh, Karen Ray. We worked with her talked with all level tracks. What are your needs? What, where have your losses been because of COVID? What improvements could you do that would help you rebound? Uh, so we talked with various track owners uh, all over the state uh, with her. We formulated uh, the piece of legislation. Then I had to work it through the political process. And, and that's, uh, um, I, that's a lot of handshaking, a lot of convincing, a lot of <laughs> talking data with some people uh, uh, other people, uh, you know, giving them a, we want you back hat, you know, yeah. convinced them that, Hey, yeah. uh, this is what we need to do because it, it, it's good. But, um, well, it, it was fun stuff. That is fantastic. And I'm glad that you shared what you were doing because it wasn't like you just showed up yesterday, uh, at an event, but you were behind the scenes really doing the, the, the nuts and bolts work. Oh, oh, very much so. I, I mean, we took the American recovering money very seriously. Uh, even though we received all this federal money, we wanted to make sure that the money going out was for its purpose, which was to help reboot uh, businesses and business laws. So we tried keeping everything very focused. Uh, some legislators just didn't realize the economic impact of motorsports statewide uh, and how it affects statewide. They know what the Charlotte Motor Speedway is, but beyond that, they didn't realize that we have little small dirt tracks that are running on the weekends. Uh, Bowman Gray in Winston-Salem, a packed house on the weekends. And he was unable to open his track for almost two years because of the COVID restrictions. 
uh, while we were down here trying to push back on those to try to get these businesses to be able to recover on themselves. The, these sports uh, event venues were uh, hit dramatically. And for many of the small ones, I don't think if they got this little boost to help them kind of get back on their feet, I, I think several of them probably would have closed. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a thought. We think about restaurants, bars, you know what I mean? Not being able to open, but doesn't really cross your mind too much unless you see you know, a race at Charlotte where there's no fans or Daytona or somewhere like that where there's literally no fans. You don't really think about these small uh, entrepreneurs that are running racetracks uh, and running races every weekend and suddenly they're closed. Oh, sure. And, and it's a pipeline issue. If we want to grow the sport and, and keep the sport vibrant, which 90 percent of the race teams are based here in North Carolina, you have to have a pipeline of people. Uh, pipeline of uh, the crews, the um, drivers. And the only way you get that pipeline is with small tracks and then mid-sized tracks and they work their way up. It's almost like baseball, you know, yeah. you know single A, uh, triple A. It's the same concept, but people don't think of it in those terms because uh, like you said, they're, they're sitting watching the Sunday race, which is the big leagues, you know, yeah, the, exactly. the NBA of, of stock car, but they don't realize that many of those drivers uh, they started out in their teens uh, racing um, modifieds on, yeah. on a dirt track that yeah. was a community track. I have a good friend who's doing that right now, and I'm hoping he'll be able to work his way up. Let's, uh, uh, to coin a phrase, shift gears. Sure, uh, yeah. At this point. No pun intended, um, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, part of my job working at the legislature, as you know, is to talk about positive things and Throughout this last legislative session, Representative Elmore, I started coining a phrase that I felt like this was one of the most meaningful legislative sessions that I had ever been a part of. There were bills that I thought were really going to help people. I mean, obviously, you, you guys pass a lot of bills down there. Some are technical in nature. Sure. Some are broad, sweeping uh, budget uh, type bills. But there were uh, pieces of legislation that got passed uh, with oftentimes bipartisan support that are really helping people. And uh, for example, what I think is really, really positive is uh, there were two bills. One that allows a, a religious clergy to go in and uh, minister to someone who is in the hospital. You know, the COVID folks uh, setting the rules, setting up, you can't have your preacher can't have your pastor. And then the other one was similar to it. You couldn't have a family member and you guys passed legislation allowing for that. So, I mean, as a citizen, I'm sitting here scratching my head going, good grief, let the pastor in. And it's almost a shame that you had to pass a bill, but you guys did take that on. And uh, uh, I thought it was pretty meaningful. Oh, I, I totally agree. I, I think COVID in one way exposed so many, um, I, I guess, bureaucratic processes that we never uh, imagined could happen. Yeah. Uh, happening. And um, I don't want to say they were uh, not well, um, proper motivation behind them. Sure. Uh, but my wife worked in hospice for years. And the importance of having clergy there, mm -hmm. especially in the, the process of death, is critical. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's critical on what our nation's based on. So when we even had to address the issue, it was a shame. But yes, that is something that because we've passed that, you're guaranteed to have that regardless if we go through a COVID or a whatever the next whatever could be, that we've guaranteed that right for North Carolinians, which is critical. Uh, your spiritual leader, uh, your your spiritual confidant, uh, in in a unhealthy when you're in an unhealthy state, that's critical. That that to me, that's as important as the doctor giving you the medicine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I th I think that was great, and I'm so uh, proud of you guys for doing that. And uh, I told you I wanted to keep this to a to a, a certain length of time. I don't want to just yammer on and and sure. people get tired of <laughs> of hearing me ask you questions, but I do think it's important, Representative Elmore, to look at uh, the last legislative session 
everybody knows it dragged on and on and on with the budget and all that. Here we are uh, on the uh, doorstep of the short session. Uh, is it going to be a short session, do you think? Uh, I know the leadership is saying, yeah, we want to get in and out. Uh, what are you thinking? I, I, I don't know. I, I never... Um... I never come into this when I come down here with a certain set of expectations. Uh, the way that this place works, it, it, it flows and it kind of plays off one another. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not holding a high expectation that it's going to be fast, that it's going to be long. Uh, I think that as we start the process, which we've already started some, I mean, we've done probably two weeks worth of footwork just on uh, getting revenue projections, that sort of thing kind of getting our foundation or, or our feet settled, I guess mm -hmm. is the best comparison. Uh, we just have to see where it goes. And we need to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the state, uh, meeting the needs of the citizens, and that we always remember that we work for the people uh, and whatever we do with their money, it's not our money, that is um, balanced and that it's fair um, for all of the state and all of the different sectors. So. I'm one of those that if that takes four months to get accomplished, we'll do it four months. Or if it takes two weeks, it takes two weeks. Yeah. Um, well, I just, I don't set the, the time frames. You said something there that uh, triggered a thought. You said revenue projections. Yes. And obviously that last couple of weeks, we've heard that you guys might have a lot more money than you initially thought. And it, it, it never ceases to amaze me, Representative Elmore, that there are those from a policy standpoint who want to go, oh boy, let's spend, spend, spend. And that just doesn't work. You guys have, have proven, I think, over a decade or more that being prudent with state money, having uh, common sense tax reform, uh, easing regulations on businesses, not to the point where you know, people are in danger, but taking things that are onerous and, and, and just, again, common sense regulations for businesses, it works. I mean, the economic development in our state has been crazy. I mean, it's just amazing. And so uh, I'm sure that without giving anything away, obviously, when you look at, oh, boy, we're going to have, you know, millions of dollars more than we thought. You're not sitting there thinking, oh boy, let's go spend and, and you know, put ourselves in a, in a position of jeopardy. Sure. Um, I, I think we've done a good job because the reality of it is uh, government cannot create jobs other than government jobs, uh, but we can create a climate. Uh, we can foster the supply side uh, of the economy through things that you just talked about. Uh, regulations that just don't make sense that really are on the books for probably a special interest reason that, and mm -hmm. it was 25 years ago, that kind of thing. Looking at those and really analyzing those through uh, regulatory reform bills, uh, being prudent with the spending. I mean, when we came in, uh, and I've been here, uh, this is my 10th year. Uh, when I first came in the term before, uh, the, the budget was uh, in disarray. The, the spending had gotten out of control, the revenues, because we hit the 2008 recession, just were not there. Uh, I, I lived under furloughs as a teacher mm. uh, prior to that. I, I mean, it directly affects people. And, and this up and down with uh, the uh, government spending, it, it just doesn't work. We, we've created more stability with it. And, and we've got pressure factors that we're facing. Uh, we've got uh, high inflation. I'll call it Biden inflation, uh, you know, uh, going on because yeah. they focus more on the not the supply side, but the demand side. Uh, we throw money at it and, and it will fix. Well, when you throw money at it and people keep on expending money and your supply chain issues are not there, prices are going to skyrocket. That's so right. a lot of the things that we want to accomplish is just going to cost us more. So we have to be prudent with the people's money to make sure we can accomplish goals or that we don't have to do something and we can't. And the only way that we can fix it is to uh, increase the tax burden and We've created a climate where we have a balanced tax system. Uh, we're not heavily taxing in any arena. Like we don't have a massive sales tax like a Tennessee does. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the tax burden is even and it creates consistency. And I think that's one reason why the, the business growth is good. Uh, they know that 
uh, it's consistent here. They're, they're not going to be on this roller coaster of up and down uh, that they are suffering from in many states. And, and we weathered the storm through COVID because of these decisions before. Uh, many states are not in the uh, situation that we're in. And it's all because we're not thinking, you know, the six months ahead for the next election, we're thinking the decisions we're making today how is it going to affect North Carolina five years from now, 10 years from now? Yeah. And, and I think it's just a, a, a paradigm shift uh, with uh, our Republican led legislator because it, it didn't operate that way. Uh, well, I, I would say in my lifetime, you know, 20, 25 years prior to us taking control, it was basically let's get through the two years and we'll see what the next two years gives us and we'll just work from there. Uh, that, that, that's not good. It doesn't create a good climate for our people or, or for our businesses. You know, I was in uh, the radio business 2006 to 2008 and uh, worked at WPTF, which was a big talk show at the time, very influential. And I remember having guests on our morning news program during all of this time where the other side was managing the, the state's finances and they had received a large uh, surplus of money at that time. Can't remember what it was, but it was huge. We had uh, lots of different opinions on what the, they should do with that money. Well, they spent it, and all of a sudden, uh, taxes going up, at furloughs of teachers, goodness gracious, state employees, uh, tax increases, and still, you said disarray. As I recall, it was a $3 billion budget shortfall when you guys came to town. It wasn't like you could come to town and say, wow, we're the majority party. You had to get your pencil out and go, goodness gracious, how are we going to fix this thing? Oh, very much so. And, and um, cuts become real. Um, when, when you are looking at employees and you're looking at employee numbers and, and you're looking at uh, layoffs and, the, and there's assist, uh, essential services that you cannot cut, um, it, it, you had to go into the budget uh I don't want to say like a scalpel, but with a microscope, finding all of this stuff. And, and then as we have worked through that and we've gotten our revenue streams proper and that consistency, well, what stuff did we really even need? I, I think that was the question yeah. when I first got down here. Well, we cut it. Did, did we really even miss it? And that was kind of the next step. And then looking at where we did have holes, where we uh, were not doing what we needed to do. Uh, compensation was one of those pieces, working on that. And, and, and I think that's a constant process mm -hmm. as the national politics continue to be in disarray. Uh, compensation is going to still be an issue that, that we're continually facing. Um, you know, uh, you said uh, something about recession in 2008. The Federal Reserve chairman uh, yesterday uh, made a uh, press conference, had a press conference, and he said, folks, I don't know that, that we're going to be able to avoid a recession, right? even with interest rates, because of what's going on uh, in other countries and uh, energy prices. And so as a citizen, and I'm not trying to butter you up here, I mean this with all my heart, I like the fact that you guys are prudent with my taxpayer dollars, and that if we do get hit with a recession, just like being able to weather COVID, I'm confident our state would be able to weather uh, a downturn in the economy. Oh, very much so. And uh, a stat that was thrown out, I heard uh, two or three days ago, that the average um, household in the United States is going to experience about $5,200 in additional expenditure just because of inflation, dealing with food wow. and fuel prices. For many of our citizens, probably for the bulk of our citizens, they can't absorb that. No. And what's sad is I read another article that what they're doing is basically just eating it on a credit card and they're putting it on the credit card, the extra expense, hoping that the kind of the storm will pass by. And uh, I, I'm a little worried with the inflation at the level that it is, the Fed's gonna fight it with interest rates. And now this was pre me, okay? Uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s, uh, a lot of people remember what that was like. And yeah. uh, you, you, you were happy to get an 18% loan. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and when that happens, it will slow down the economy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And, uh, 
you know, I, I saw another one that said, uh, another analysis that said a recession could be good because oh it God. resets everything. Yeah. But with as volatile, uh, volatile as things have been, I, I don't think that the citizens of North Carolina, or at least my constituents, I'm, I think like you, Mark, I, I don't think they could handle it. I don't think we could handle another 2008 and, and those borderline employees that finally saw their wage growth and they were able to expend extra money on things that they haven't been able to do in years because the economy was booming. Wages were growing naturally. It wasn't forced by the government because wage pressure. Uh, it just takes them back. They got three steps forward and it'll knock them five steps back. Yeah. And they could spend the rest of their generation uh, still back. And, and I just don't want to see that for North Carolinians. No, I don't either. And but you said something. I'm going to uh, wind this up here. Uh, but uh, there's so many questions I'd like to ask you. Um, but one I think is really important is you mentioned your constituents, and you also said that you're in your tenth year. Yes. So I uh, I got to tell a story to embarrass myself a little bit. The very first time I was in the legislative office building, I had a job interview, 2011. I got lost. I was late for the interview. It's like a corn maze in that place if yes. you've never been in there. And so uh, I'm sure you didn't get lost like I did, but there has to be a, a sense of being overwhelmed when you come in there for the first time as a new legislator. Now, you're a veteran for lack of a better word, chairing one of the most important committees, appropriations, one of the uh, uh, chairs of that committee. And yet, no matter how many responsibilities you get like that, would you agree that taking that phone call, helping that constituent who's trying to navigate the maze of bureaucracy and get something done is still the most important thing that you do? Number one priority. Um, the way I look at it is in the North Carolina House, I am the only voice for the 94th district. I am the advocate. There's nobody else here that will advocate for that area of the state. That's just the reality of it because everybody's here to advocate and to do what's best for their area. That's the reality of it. That's the reason why we're a representative uh, democracy. I mean, that's just the way that it works. That is the number one priority. And that's probably some of the best work that my office has done is when we get that phone call and we've had people call and they're in tears by the time they call us. And it could be with the Department of Revenue. Uh, and they said, I've talked with this person, this person, this person. I've been dealing with this for three months. I don't know what else to do. And we can link them with the right person that can go directly to whatever their problem is and try to get it resolved. Now, many times it's not the resolution that the constituent wants, but we always get the response back. Thank you so much because you navigated, you helped me navigate this, like you said, the bureaucracy of it to where at least I could get an answer. I could get closure or, or I could get uh, what I thought I was going to get. Right. And, and that's so true with so many of the departments and uh, just how it works. And it's a shame that government is that big. Uh, but, you know, we're a state of almost 12 million people at this point. We're over 11 million. I, I mean, it's unbelievable uh, the size of North Carolina. We're bigger yeah. than many of the countries across the world. So uh, it, it's a bit, it's, um, it's hard to navigate our government. Yeah, yeah. Well, Representative Elmore, uh, this is a significant day. You are our very first guest here on In the House. Uh, I could talk to you for another two hours. You're just fascinating. A lot of topics I didn't get to cover, uh, workforce development, education. Sure. We'll hit those next time. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining us today. On oh, In thank the House. you, Mark. I, I enjoyed the time, and, and I always love talking. So I'm like you. I could sit and talk for two hours about this stuff. But Good. I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. You have a great day. Yes, you also. All right. Bye-bye.